Estimating the time since the Big Bang has long been one of the most hotly contested studies in the science of the universe, as a definitive answer, could help to unlock many secrets of life and our planet's humble origins. While most models have suggested an age of 13.8 billion years for the conceivable universe, a brand new study seemed to confirm that number is significantly off. Imagine our universe is not the youthful 13.8 billion years old as once thought. Instead, it could have existed for a whopping 26.7 billion years or even be far older. Let that sink in for a moment. That's twice as old as previously thought. That shocking result is based on a brand new research conducted by University of Ottawa physics professor Rajendra Gupta. Gupta bring into the calculus a 1929 theory from Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky. The theory claims that photons get tired as they travel across vast distances and lose energy over the course of billions of years. While this conflicts with observable redshift data, Gupta says that by allowing this theory to coexist with the expanding universe, it becomes possible to reinterpret the redshift as a hybrid phenomenon rather than purely due to expansion. And increasing the universe's age could help explain some long-standing cosmological quandaries, as well as some new ones discovered by NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. One of the oldest stars known to science is HD Parvitin 283, more colorfully called the Methuselah Star. Named in reference to a biblical patriarch who is said to have died aged 969, making him the longest lived of all the figures in the Bible. More than 100 years ago, Methuselah Star was a staggering 1445 billion years old with an uncertainty of 0.8 billion years. Such a figure was rather baffling. After all, the age of the universe, determined from observations of the cosmic microwave background, is 13.8 billion years old. So how can a star be older than the universe? It was a serious discrepancy, says astronomer Howard Bond of Pennsylvania State University. But Methuselah isn't the only cosmological anomaly. Since James Webb first started sending back science data in mid-2022, the internationally funded state-of-the-art telescope has been giving us images of distant galaxies that appear to have formed and matured far earlier than our models predicted. Webb's Hall of Galactic Baby Pictures has proved more bountiful than most researchers dared to dream. Simply put, candidate galaxies in the early universe are popping up in numbers that defy predictions, with dozens found so far. It's enough of a problem that some are calling it a challenge to our entire cosmic timeline. According to the Standard Model of Cosmology, or the Lambda Cold Dark Matter Model, after the fiery Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, the universe cooled and energy turned into matter that eventually coalesced during the first few hundred million years, forming the first generation of stars and galaxies. Astronomers thought they had a decent understanding of this process. But Webb's initial results may suggest that stars and galaxies were forming far faster than anyone expected. The telescope had done nothing less, read the headlines, than break the universe and upend models of cosmic history. Subsequent data have ruled out some of the more dramatic findings, and new simulations can accommodate at least a few of the strange observations. But some bright, massive, and early galaxies continue to confound theorists, suggesting that our understanding could shift in the coming years. According to Priyamvada Natarajan, a theoretical astrophysicist at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, no data at the moment has broken the universe. But I think there are interesting potential tensions emerging on different scales. Resolving these tensions will require researchers to revisit their fundamental assumptions about galactic evolution. That could mean bringing new ideas to the forefront while leaving others in the cosmic dustbin. Prior to the launch of James Webb, no one knew if galaxies could even form so early in the universe's 13.8 billion year history. 
at a time when matter was thought to still be sedately coalescing into the gravitationally bound clumps required to give birth to large groups of stars. As Garth Illingworth, an astronomer at the University of California Santa Cruz, said at a press conference held by NASA to announce the peer-reviewed validation of the first two candidates, and so we're wondering, do we really understand the early phases of the formation of these galaxies? This has posed a lot of questions for the theorists. Chief among them is how exactly dark matter guided the emergence of galaxies. For the first few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the cosmos was so hot that gravity could not pull normal matter together to form large protogalactic clumps. Yet this was not an issue for dark matter, says Jorge Peñarubia, a cosmologist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Because dark matter does not interact via electromagnetic forces, in Stead, gravity alone is this invisible substance's master, meaning that in mere moments after the Big Bang, when primordial chaos otherwise reigned, gravity immediately began glomming to gather dark matter into large clumps known as halos. These dark matter halos are believed to have acted as gravitational sinks for normal matter, seeding the subsequent formation of galaxies in the early universe. The telltale motions of the stars they shepherd betray their endurance to this day. Such halos still surround galaxies like our own, majestic but invisible sculptors of the modern cosmos. James Webb's rapid discovery of early galaxies might be testing our understanding of how these halos form, perhaps suggesting they reached an immense bulk earlier than expected. One explanation might involve the very nature of dark matter itself, Theorists have found that simple treatments of dark matter, in which it only interacts with itself and normal matter via gravity, can accurately replicate large-scale cosmic structure. But nature has no guarantee of simplicity. In reality, dark matter could interact with itself because of an as-yet unknown force, perhaps via a particle that's not in the current standard model of physics, possibly increasing the speed at which these halos grew and explaining how big, bright galaxies were able to arise so quickly. However, perhaps instead, these halos were simply more efficient at drawing in regular matter to feed star formation. I think this is probably telling us something about how stars form in dark matter halos early on, Peñarubia says. Today, our galaxy produces roughly one new star per year, but Castellano's paper suggests that star formation rates must have been at least 20 times higher in his and Naidu's two candidate galaxies. Another web-derived preprint paper posits that Milky Way-sized galaxies could have arisen just a half billion years after the Big Bang, a scenario that would demand star formation rates 10 times higher still than Castellano's estimates. But according to Michael Boylan Colchin, a cosmologist at the University of Texas at Austin, such outsize rates of star formation stretch the boundaries of what is physically possible. If those values are correct, you'd need to have galaxies turning all their mass into stars and forming stars as fast as they could, he says. Researchers have likened the impossible early galaxy problem to flipping through someone's old photo album, expecting to find baby pictures and seeing a full-grown adult instead. With a person, you might just conclude that they're older than you thought, but with early galaxies, you very quickly run into a problem with the age of the universe itself. And that's where Rajendra Gupta's brand new study can come in. Gupta believes that he can explain the conundrum that has long puzzled scientists about these ancient galaxies. Studies by Gupta suggest the universe is closer to 26.7 billion years old, almost double previous estimates. In other words, his newly devised model stretches the galaxy formation time by a several billion years, allowing James Webb impossible massive early galaxies to exist. According to Gupta, that number is significantly off, mostly due to our limited understanding of stretched light waves. As space expands, stretching ever distant in an infinitely growing universe, it becomes harder and harder to quantify how much light we are capable of seeing in the distance. 
As you may know, the further you look into the distant universe, the farther you look back in time to catch a brief snapshot of the past due to the speed it takes light to reach across the vacuum of space. Some scientific models liken this process to a spring stretching and pulling apart to reach greater heights and distances and compressing to allow for flexibility. One difficult-to-understand prospect of most enormous telescopes and deep space technology seems to suggest that redder lights are the oldest lights, having lost their sheen from the difficulty of traveling long distances. As scientists continue to search the deepest reaches of the universe that they can with modern technology, we're frequently seeing redder and redder light. However, Gupta suggests that this red light distinction can be used to determine when the universe maintained more concentrated energy, seemingly snapping the spring into place. Notably, the new idea put forth by Gupta keeps most of the same assumptions in place, but offers a few subtle but important changes. First, instead of assuming that only the Doppler shift, the relative motions of the light-emitting source and the light-absorbing observer, the gravitational shift, the difference in the space-time curvature between the emitting source and the absorbing observer, and the cosmological shift as the traveling, Gupta also presupposes an idea first put forth by noted astronomer Fritz Zwicky back in 1929, the tired light hypothesis, or the notion that light, as it travels through space, inherently radiates, and loses energy as it travels, becoming tired before it arrives at the observer. And second, instead of the standard assumption that the laws of physics and the fundamental constants behind them are constant with time, Gupta invokes an assumption that others have explored previously, that the fundamental constants the speed of light, Planck's constant, and the gravitational constant aren't actually constant in time, but vary. In particular, they vary in a special way, changing altogether, so that the combinations of these constants that govern atomic transitions and the emission-absorption lines that we wind up observing won't change as we look to earlier, more distant galaxies within the expanding universe. However, note that one of the remarkable features of science is that if you have multiple different models that have different underlying assumptions that go into them, there's a scientific way to tell which one is superior. It isn't to look at personal preference, elegance, aesthetics, or simplicity. Instead, there are two key questions that we have to evaluate. Which theory has fewer free parameters? Which theory better fits the full suite of data concerning the universe? The reason we look at the number of free parameters is simple. A theory that can make the same predictions as another but with fewer assumptions or required inputs is a superior physical theory to one that requires more assumptions, required inputs, or free parameters. Early on, geocentric and heliocentric models of the solar system had the same number of free parameters as both ideas needed to provide a series of orbital parameters to describe each planet. If a new planet would have been discovered, neither model would have been able to predict its motion without adding in those new parameters. When Newtonian gravity came along, however, the number of free parameters plummeted. With an underlying force governing the dynamics of bodies in the solar system, the force of gravity, a planet's orbital speed, distance from the sun, and motion through the sky were all shown to be related. This increase in predictive power with fewer free parameters is always a scientific indicator that we're on the right track. But it's also vitally important to look at the full suite of data, as opposed to just the pieces of data that are easily fit by your model or preferred theory. In order to be considered a success, you have to consider everything that we observe on all scales, from subatomic ones to cosmic ones, is consistent with and not in conflict with your theory for how the universe works. In his paper, to his credit, Gupta looks at a few important pieces of the puzzle. He looks at the inferred distance to supernovae seen at a wide variety of cosmic distances and shows that not only are they consistent with the standard cosmological model, 
but also with a version of the Lambda Cold Dark Matter model that includes tired light, with a model with covarying coupling constants, and with a model with covarying coupling constants and tired light included. While yes, he's including two extra free parameters in his theory, as opposed to standard model, in the form of a tired light component to the universe, and also in the form of a set of covarying coupling constants. This remains consistent with what we've observed for how distances, redshifts, and brightnesses appear in the expanding universe. In addition, Gupta also notes that, by introducing tired light on its own, in addition to the standard ingredients in a standard cosmology, he arrives at a universe that ages much more slowly at very high redshifts, whereas a standard model universe has experienced only 13.8 billion years since the hot Big Bang. A lambda cold dark matter universe with tired light would be about 6 billion years older, up to about 19 and change billion years old. Additionally, much of that aging would come early on. Whereas galaxies seen at the limit of Hubble and near the edge of James Webb's capabilities at a redshift of Z equals 10 would be only 400 million years old in the lambda cold dark matter they would be about 2 billion years old in the Lambda Cold Dark Matter model with tired light. Furthermore, by introducing both covering coupling constants and tired light, he can increase the total age of the universe to be a whopping 26.7 billion years. At a redshift of Z equals 10, instead of 400 million, or even 2 billion years, the universe would already be about toss 6 billion years old an impressively large figure. Gupta contends that, whereas James Webb has shown us galaxies that appear brighter, more massive, and more evolved than had been expected to be seen so early on, his modified cosmology, with tired light and varying coupling constants, these galaxies suddenly fall into line with expectations. But as we said earlier, science isn't about solely looking at the data points that favor your explanation. That's what we call cherry-picking, and that's a surefire way to lead us toward biased conclusions. There are key pieces of evidence that would show up if either light got tired as it traveled through the universe and or if the fundamental constants have changed as the universe has evolved. They would show up in extremely telling ways, and we can actually list a few of them off before looking at the evidence that the universe itself presents on these fronts. Here are four of the most major ones. First, tired light would add a blurring effect to distant galaxies. When Zwicky first proposed the tired light idea in 1929, it was one of the few astronomical ideas that wasn't viable even at the moment it was proposed. The reason. Zwicky himself recognized, even prior to publishing the idea, that if there were something causing the light to get tired, something for it to interact with, and that caused it to lose energy. Then more distant objects wouldn't just appear redder, as their light's lost energy would de-boost it to longer wavelengths, but would also appear blurrier. In fact, those more distant objects would be blurred by a greater amount than observations would have permitted. In the image above, you can see two objects, one that's a massive foreground object at a relatively shallow redshift, and one that's a much more distant background object at a much higher redshift. If the tired light scenario played any role in causing the redshift of these objects, the more distant objects would be more severely blurred. Yet, in this, as well as other images that show nearby and high redshift objects together, no such blurring has ever been observed. The universe doesn't get blurrier the farther away we look, the optical limits of our telescopes and observatories shows that 100% of the observed redshift is cosmic. Second, tired light would eliminate cosmological time dilation. Here's a fact that we don't often think about. The more redshifted an object's light is, the more time it takes for the same number of emitted wavelengths to be seen by the distant observer. An object at a redshift of Z equals 1 would have its wavelength stretched by 100% over an object that was in the here and now, at a redshift of z equals 0, in order for the same number of crests and trucs 
of a wave to pass us by. Because they only arrive half as frequently, we'd have to wait twice as long. This results in a very interesting implication, that when we look out at the distant high redshift universe, we should see those distant objects exhibit a cosmological time dilation, where their clocks appear to run slow from our perspective. We've seen this for a variety of cosmic objects, including for distant supernovae, where the more red-shifted a supernova is, the more its light curve gets stretched out in time. This was recently confirmed at greater redshifts by looking at a class of objects, quasars, that appear to tick with a regular periodicity. Going all the way back to when the universe was under 1 billion years old, 100% of the redshift, again appears to be cosmological, and these quasars show a time dilation of exactly the amount predicted by our standard model of cosmology. With no difference observed, none of the redshift can be chalked up to tired light. Third, tired light would change the thermal blackbody spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. This is a very, very big one. Whereas the galaxies we're looking at go up to a modest redshift of Z equals 13, which is where the current cosmic record holder presently sits. The cosmic microwave background was emitted back at a whopping redshift of Z equals 1089, when the universe was only 380,000 years old according to standard model. When light redshifts due to cosmological expansion, it maintains its black body character. The spectrum of how photons are distributed remains in thermal equilibrium. The number density of photons, however, has to drop to match that of a cooler black body, and in the lambda cold dark matter model, it does. But if light were to get tired, instead, the energy of the individual photons that compose the cosmic microwave background would still drop. But the number density wouldn't change. As a result, the spectrum of tired light that appears as a cosmic background would not obey a black body spectrum. And yet, with data from NASA's old Cosmic Background Explorer mission, the Cosmic Microwave Background is the most perfect black body ever measured. The only way to save this aspect of tired light cosmology would be to observe some sort of non-black body component to the Cosmic Microwave Background, but to date, none has ever been observed. Evolving coupling constants wouldn't just affect the distant universe, but would appear in laboratory experiments here on Earth. But there's an independent set of constraints we can put on Gupta's second idea, the notion that the coupling constants change over time. Atomic transitions are governed by changes in two of the fundamental constants, the speed of light and Planck's constant, while cosmological changes are sensitive to the gravitational constant as well as the speed of light and Planck's constant. But on Earth, we have independent ways to check these constants independently, including how they've evolved over time. While laboratory measurements of the electron magnetic moment, the spin-flip transition of hydrogen, and the equivalence of inertial to gravitational mass all provide good constraints, we have a far stronger one that proves the constancy of these fundamental constants over time. Earth's only natural nuclear reactor. By looking at how the nuclear reactions occurred under the natural conditions that existed on Earth 1.7 billion years ago, we can determine that the fine structure constant, which depends on the electron charge, the speed of light, and Planck's constant, changes by less than now 3 parts in 10 quadrillion or 10 to the power of 16 per year. That constraint is, quite literally, billions of times stronger than what Gupta's varying fundamental constant explanation would require. It is for these reasons, among others, that we can overwhelmingly conclude that even though Gupta's toy model of the universe may be fun to play with, it has no basis in reality as far as either tired light or covering fundamental constants are concerned. Observations of the universe, from in focus distant galaxies to cosmologically time-dilated events to a black-body cosmic microwave background spectrum to nuclear reactors right here on Earth, all show that these ideas do not correspond to our actual reality. 
It might be fun to explore or theorize about, but at the end of the day, the universe is our laboratory, and whatever it reveals to us about how nature actually behaves is what we have to go with. The universe might not be fully understood, but its age is definitely 13.8 billion years old, and absolutely cannot be 26.7 billion years old, based on the evidence at hand. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.